This time he makes sure that he's at Soho House first, you know, because <laughs> can't have another repeat of that absolute beating. And she comes and he had brought her a little present. She comes in beautiful. She's wearing a blue sundress with white pinstripes. She's a glow. And he stands up, I beg gifts. And it's a pink box. She held it forward and she shakes it. What's this? Oh, no, 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 don't shake it, don't shake it. It's cupcakes, you know, red, white, and blue for the 4th of July. Already turning his back on the Brits. Good morning, how are you? I am so glad to be sitting down recording this. This is the third time I've sat down to record this section and I kept getting interrupted and things kept happening and there was, or there'd be a big storm outside. Like yesterday when I sat down to film, it sounded as though I needed to go seek shelter. The wind was like blowing so hard. So that's the Texas prairies for you. But anyway, I couldn't wait to get into this because who should be coming up today? Miss Meghan Markle. So in this section, okay, so you know the book is divided into three sections. So we did the first section, you know, him explaining his youth. And then we did his, the second section, which is him being a bachelor. And we have to finish that little last bit of him being a bachelor. And then we get into Megan today. So it'll be a little bit later in the episode, but we do get to her today. Now, I want to say, I really am trying to look at this book super objectively. I mean, this, I'm not, I'm trying not to add in anything else from the world. Like I want, I'm looking at this book as a primary source. This is him coming to me or coming to us and saying, here's my life, look at it. And so I'm looking at his life just based on what he's saying. And I know he's lying a lot. Like I see in the comments people all the time being like, you know he's a liar, right? And I'm like, 100% I know he's a liar. But I want to see him lie to me in this book, which he's done multiple times. He's gone back on what he said. He said things that don't make sense. He tells one story and then later tells another. He's super hypocritical. I'm fully aware that his idea of truth it's all over the place, but I'm still wanting to read this book as like a standalone material. So in that mindset, I thought, okay, when we get to the Megan part, I'm going to want to bring all of my emotions and feelings about who she is and what she's done to the reading when he first meets her. But I can't do that because there's some reason why he fell for her at the beginning. So she must have been super charming at the beginning. And I was ready to be like, okay, I'm gonna put aside all my thoughts, go back to who I was when Megan first entered the picture. And I thought she was a, you know, really beautiful, lovely breath of fresh air. Thought she was gorgeous. I still think she's very beautiful, but beauty has nothing to do with it. Um, and I thought, okay, I will, I, I don't understand now why he's with her, but I'm, I'm sure that when I read the part, when he meets her, I'll be like, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a sweet, lovely time. Nope, 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 nope. I don't get it, I don't get it. You guys, on their very first date, she was so rude, so condescending to him. I mean, his sense of worth is on the floor right now, right? Because, you know, he makes a lot of wild claims about how he was agoraphobic. Okay, he wasn't, because an agoraphobic literally cannot leave the house and he seems like he was able to pull it together from time to time. But. Even with that said, he's not mentally well. And so for him to walk into this relationship with this woman who from the onset is very obviously manipulative. Um, and you can just, you see it on the page. Like he'll say something to her and then like, you can just see how she's using it. Like, oh, hey, some tasty morsels. She's just so, um, she's such a predator. And it comes off immediately. And it's not because we already think of her as a predator. It's just who she is. So stick with me until like for this beginning bit where we talk all about him partying in LA like a madman, even though he's agoraphobic. And then we finally get into the Megan stuff. Um, he's also does some stuff in Africa and has a big fight with William. So we got a lot to cover before we get to Megan that's still really good. Okay, um, before we get into it, let's see. Was there anything from the last episode I need to clarify? I don't think so. A lot of people reminded us that TJ Maxx, or TK Maxx as they say, um, 
doesn't even have an annual sale. So what's he talking about? Which is true because the store itself is a sale every day. So, you know, here's Harry trying to act like he's so normal. He can't even get that right. Okay. Um, oh, and then of course, all my prerequisite. <laughs> you guys, will you please like and subscribe to the channel? Please send it to a friend. Please. Um, all right, so now that we're done with that song and dance, let's get into it. <laughs> this section, you guys, the first line of it is like, like I mean, we start off with that banger. <laughs> this, is, this first line just makes you wanna go, check yourself in, you strange man baby. Okay, so he says that after, remember we ended with the story where he goes to that hospital, he meets that woman who says that she had known mummy. And he is talking to the woman and the woman says, oh yes, your mother would come in and she'd cuddle and she was just so lovely. And he's super jealous because he doesn't have any memories of mummy. And it's the first time he actually admits, I don't really know the woman who my whole life has revolved around. So anyway, I guess after that, you know, brutal reality, he decides he needs to go to Botswana to visit Tish and Mike. Y'all buckle up, listen to this line and try and, and grab your sick buckets, grab your sick buckets, you'll need it. I visited Botswana and I spent a few days with Tish and Mike. I felt a craving for them, a physical need to wander with Mike, to sit once more with my head in Tisha's lap, talking and feeling safe. <coughs> what? 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 Okay. Why is this man sitting with his head in the lap of a woman who is his quasi-mom and she's petting his head and they're having these quiet moments of comfort together? If I walked in, and found my husband with his head in his mother's lap and she's petting his head and whispering sweet comfort to him, I would immediately throw up on the floor. That is the most disgusting thing. What in the world? Pull it together. Are you a man? Did you go to Afghanistan? Like, I just, you guys, that is like, that is bananas. This, you don't need, who, this strange woman who you met out in the, you know, wilds of Africa filming, you've developed such a rapport with her that you need to run down from England down to Africa so you can put your head in her lap? Like, you feel physical need for that? That's gross and disgusting to me. Okay. He says that he had to go down there because he had to talk to some people about his mental situation. And he says that um, he just hadn't, he hadn't opened up to anybody. Uh, I call BS on that. You sat Pa down and had a huge long talk with him about how terrible he'd been and how all of your failings as an adult male can all be boiled down to the, his lack of parenting. You made him apologize to you. So <laughs> there's one person that you told. You've, t you, you've talked to William about it ad nauseum. You're mad at him because he didn't identify your panic attacks, even when you weren't really identifying what was going on, enough to go to a doctor about it. And so, you know, he's talked to folks about it. Um, it, it, it's just like, how many more people do you have to tell before you just go get some help? Anyway, he says he, he trundles on down to Africa to lay his head in Tisha's lap and wander in the woods with Mike. And while he's down there, they're sitting around a campfire and he wants to tell them, you know, I'm having a lot of mental health problems, but don't worry. Um, I have found a litany of things that I think might help, you know, let me count the ways. So he says, um, therapy. Now, mind you, he hasn't found a therapist to attend him and to, to see about all of his, his many, many needs. But the idea has crossed his mind. He's met with a few, didn't like any of them, but the idea of therapy, he's open to it. Okay, well, I should think so, since your big complaint against Pa is that he never brought you into therapy after Mummy died. Like, you're telling me that just now it has occurred to you that therapy could be an option for you? That's what you've been griping about for years. Okay, so, you know, he's patting himself on the back for the bright idea of therapy. Then he goes, you know what? I think I might have PTSD. He says that on the, like, you know, an off-handed comment from a therapist that he might have post-traumatic stress disorder really triggered something in his mind that, oh, yeah. I bet I do. And it's like, you need a therapist to make an offhanded comment about the fact that you could have post-traumatic stress disorder when you did get back from Afghanistan. And if you were the soldier that you say you were, it is almost a requirement to come back uh, not quite well. 
I mean, it's like if you were over there doing your job, you're going to come back, not all that you were when you left. And I, I also just don't understand why suddenly the light bulb has gone off because it's like, but Harry, you've been doing all of this work with veterans, right? You say you are. And you're telling us that over and over and over, you, you know, doing this charity and going and doing that and walking about with these folks. And suddenly now it has dawned on you that post-traumatic stress disorder could be part of your diagnosis as well. I guarantee you it was probably part of the diagnosis of all those veterans that you were with. Not everybody comes back missing a leg, but many come back missing parts of their hearts and minds. And so I just think that this is so weird. It's that he's like suddenly like light bulbs are going off. Were you alive with yourself all these years? I mean, where did, what did you think was going on? Why do you think you were having these panic attacks? Okay, so he says, therapy, oh, that's an idea. Oh, I have post-traumatic stress disorder. And then he shares that um, he's really gotten into psychedelics. And those are, you know, really helping him reconstruct reality. He says, psychedelics did me some good as well. I'd experimented with them over the years for fun, but now I'd begun to use them therapeutically, medicinally. They didn't simply allow me to escape reality for a while. They let me redefine reality. Under the influence of these substances, I was able to let go of rigid preconcepts, to see that there was another world beyond my heavily filtered senses, a world that was equally real and doubly beautiful, a world with no red mist, no reason for red mist, there was only truth. Well, I would like to offer this suggestion. Um, how do you know? This is my contention with psychedelics. Um, I think it would be awesome if you could take something and truly interact with the, with like the spiritual realm. But my problem is, is that I have no doubt you're interacting with the spiritual realm when you take psychedelics. But how do you know that what you're reacting with is heaven or hell? How do you know that what you're dealing with isn't darkness you know, coming to you as an angel of light. You don't know that. And you can go into these experiences and really come out of it changed. Darkness is not gonna come at you with 10 out of 10 lies. That's not how that works. They're gonna feed you like nine truths and a lie. So you come out of these experiences thinking you know something and maybe you do come out having a few more coping mechanisms. But the core of what is wrong is never fixed. And so, I mean, it's just like, I'm glad he thinks he's getting help, but I give the side eye to psychedelics a hundred percent, not because I don't think that people have like life altering experiences on them, but I don't think that it's the truth that people think that it is. Cause I also don't think that God would say, I'm not going to come to you unless I alter your mind. I don't think God makes us jump through hoops to find him. Is what I'm trying to say. And I don't think that God's saying, hey, um, I'm going to keep you in the dark unless you, you know, take some ayahuasca. Then I'll come to you. As, as, lo as long as you are sober minded, good luck. Um, anyway, he says that he just feels really chaotic unless he's nibbling a mushroom or ingesting ayahuasca. And then he feels, uh, you know, like truth is finally at his fingertips. But... Is that really a life where you can't live in the present? You're always avoiding this reality to run to this other reality? That doesn't, that doesn't sound like a sustainable way to get through life. Okay, that's just my thoughts. Um, but then he says, finally, his final solution is that he needs a cause in life. So I'm think like the veterans, yeah, that's all well and good. But after talking to a lot of people, people what he was finding out was that there was another war going on that had nothing to do with Afghanistan. And this was the war to save the planet. War, you say? Sign me up. I need a cause. So he says that, you know, this was going to be his new thing. The veterans had been all well and good. But now he needs to save the planet. The only problem is, is that William has entered the scene. And William says the planet is his to save. Particularly Africa. Now, Harry is really mad because... <laughs> As we've seen, Africa, the entire continent, belongs to him. And it's his to save. And Williams come trundled in saying the elephants and rhinos belong to him. And Harry needs to butt out because he has the veterans already. Can't William have anything? And as the heir, it belongs to him. This is what Harry tells us. Listen to what Harry writes. 
one small problem, Willie. Apricot was his thing, he said. And he had the right to say this, or felt he did, because he was the heir. It was ever in his power to veto my thing. And he had every intention of exercising, even flexing that veto power. We'd had some real rows about it, I told TJ Mike. One day, we almost came to blows in front of our childhood mates, the sons of Emily and Hugh. One of the sons asked, well, why can't you both work on Africa? Willie had a fit and he flew at the sun for daring to make such a suggestion. Because rhinos and elephants, that's mine. It was so obvious. He cared less about finding his purpose or passion than about winning his lifelong competition with me. <laughs> that's never happened. William's not in competition with you. You can't even dry your clothes and iron them and look presentable. William's not in competition with you. You can't stand up in the streets. William's not in competition with you. You break up with a new girl every day and you have a long line of women behind you who you didn't treat very well. Willie is not in competition with you. You are in competition with him, okay? And your feelings cannot be projected on everything that William does. Okay, so he claims that, um, oh, and the other thing, the other sign that William was super, um, the, the, the other sign that, that William was just super in competition with Harry is that he was really jealous that Harry got invited to the North Pole and he didn't. <sighs> William would not have been jealous of that because William couldn't have gone had he been invited. He was getting married, which is exactly why Harry's visit to the North Pole was cut short and he never actually made it there. I mean, well, not with his group, you know? And so it's like, okay, Harry, Stop making up these lies. Like you've already told us that you almost couldn't go because of the wedding. Do you think William would have accepted invitation even had he been invited? No. And he knows why he wasn't invited. He couldn't have gone. It's like, you can't, you just can't do that. Like these lies are so sloppy. The construction of this book is such a mess that you just wonder, you know, is he trying to implode? Is he trying to get people to be, I mean, like, what was the purpose of this book? We don't have time to answer that question, but really and truly, these are like the sloppiest lies ever created. Well, according to him, after he got done telling us all about the way he was going to cope with life, now that he had discovered that therapy is a thing, PTSD could be a possibility, um, drugs, and, you know, fighting Willie on the African front, they are just aghast. That's his word. They were aghast. Keep fighting, they said. There's room for both of you in Africa. There's need for both of you. Okay, I should think so. The continent's enormous. Okay, so like that is such a ridiculous story. Okay, so under their encouragement and careful tutelage, he decides that he's going to embark on a four-month fact-finding trip to educate himself about the truth of the Ivory War. So in Botswana, Nambia, Tanzania, and South Africa, there's a real problem with poachers. So he goes on this four-month thing. Okay, well, then he tells a lot of really sad stories about what the poachers were up to. And, um, you know, they wouldn't use guns a lot of times because the noise would attract attention and then they would be arrested. So a lot of times they would tranquilize these rhinos. And then when the rhino was asleep, they'd cut its horn out. And then it would wake up and then it would just bleed to death. Really, really, really upsetting. Well, I find it interesting that he should care so much considering the way he has, is known to have treated his own polo ponies. But suddenly, if you're in Africa, you should care about animals. Speaking of animals, he also has another experience with what yet one more creature, you know, whose presence is telling him all sorts of things he can't quite calculate. I wouldn't imagine he could calculate what an animal is telling him when he doesn't even know he might have PTSD. Anyway, um... He says that there was a doctor that was tagging lions and there was a lot of lions in this one area where they were camping. And the doctor said, look, next time I, I find a couple of lions and I tag them, I'll call you and you can come and, you know, get an up close look. Well, that night they're bedding down for the night. Harry, you know, trying to show off as always, is making his bed, not in a tent or anything, but just like out in the open. And everyone's like, is that why? There's a lot of lions around here. And he's like, <laughs> I've done this a million times, you guys. Just, I'm an old hand at this. So <clears throat> just as he's laying down, they hear from the doctor. He's found some lions. So they trundle off. And 
they have a couple of Nambian soldiers who come with them as well. Everyone's excited to see the lines. Who wouldn't be? So there the lines, <clears throat> there the lines are. And Harry comes and he's like looking at them and he, he, he kneels down beside the female lion. Um, and he says, I can't explain it. And I can't defend it. But I felt I knew that lion. Okay, well, you probably just watched The Lion King too many times. Um, and then he becomes incensed with rage because one of the Navian soldiers wants to pose with the lions with his AK-47. Um, I suppose, trying to make it look like, you know, this is his kill. Okay, well, whatever. Um, I don't know if Harry felt like a picture like that, like what if it was leaked and then people would think that this fact-finding mission he was on wasn't all that it could be. Maybe he just thought that it was a tacky thing to do. Um, considering the fact that they're trying to save the African wildlife and this person's acting like it's not a big deal. Um, anyway, he wants to like rip into this guy for doing it. But then Billy the Kid, oh wait, no, Billy the Rock, <laughs> his bodyguard comes, you know, t comes to life and is like, you know, get out of here, put that gun down, you know, really tells the guy off. Tells him to get the F away from the lines is what he says. Okay, and he's like, so, and the soldier slunk away. And then he said, Harry says that he turned his son to the doctor, and then there was a flash, and he turned again to see if it was a soldier trying to take pictures with his camera phone. And the flashes from the camera woke the lion out of its trance, and the lion stands up. And she's stumbling around, and the doctor's like, it's okay, it's okay. She's, you know, actually still quite dazed. And then she falls again, right at Harry's feet. Harry's like, Good night, sweet princess. And then, you know, everybody else is like running and racing away, but not him because he knew this lion. And then he says that they, you know, they get back into the truck. They go back. He still makes his bed by the fire out in the open. Everyone's like, you're joking. We just saw that there's lions around here. And he goes, trust me, that lioness isn't going to hurt anybody. In fact, she's probably watching over us. I don't think so. She looked like she was pretty out a second ago. Okay, now we get off to the part where it's like, hey, dude, I thought you had agoraphobia. You just finished telling us all about it. That's not my word. He, he said that about himself. He, he used that label, okay? So I'm not just, like, putting two and two together here. That's what he said about himself. Okay, well, now he goes off to, I mean, I guess he found, I don't know, maybe he, ate, maybe he took enough ayahuasca that now he's not afraid. But he says that a couple of friends of his were going to go to the States because one of the friends was dating this girl in LA and they thought he might like to come. Well, now we come to a series of house parties, one more boring than the next. And he says that while he was there, he got introduced to tequila. Now he had tequila, okay? He's not, you know, country bumpkin. He knows what that, he knows what that liquid is, but he never had really good tequila. So he says that he drank and drank and drank every drop they offered him and he felt bloody good. And he said, I like these Americans. I like them a lot. Then he goes on to this long rant about how Americans are the worst. Um, and he says that, I was reminded of my childhood when people warned me all the time about Americans. Too loud, too rich, too happy, too confident, too direct, too honest. Whatever was on their mind, they'd spit it out like a sneeze. And while that could be problematic at times, I usually found it preferable to the alternative. No one saying how they truly felt. No one wanting to hear how you felt. I'd experienced that at 12 years old. I experienced it even more now that I was 31. Okay, <laughs> let me let you in on something here. No Americans telling you the truth. They're just really good at making you think they're being candid. Americans are like the best at oversharing and saying everything but what is actually true. So <clears throat> you might think that they're being super honest and direct. No, That's, they just have a different way of hiding things. Okay, so he says that um, on his you know, wild spree in LA, going from house party to house party, drinking all the tequila in the state, he says that, lo and behold, whose home should he be invited to but one <laughs> Courtney Cox? Monica Geller? <laughs> well, since during his days of agoraphobia, all he did was hang out with the cast of Friends, this was the greatest day of his life. And he writes, great, 
But I was still confused because <laughs> she was Monica and I was a Chandler. And I wondered if we, I wondered if I'd ever work up the courage to tell her. Was there enough tequila in California to get me that raid? Anyway, while he's just like falling over himself with Courtney Cox, um, she, she wasn't supposed to be at the house when he got there. Like he was gonna stay at her house because she was on a, like working somewhere, but then she comes back, but she's like, the house is huge. There's more than enough room, stay on. So he stays and she throws a party. And at this party, who should show up but the guy from the Bat the Batman Lego movie? Now, I don't, I don't know who that is. Uh, but anyway, um, he goes on this like long story about how he kept making the guy say hello Harry in a specific voice. And like, it's really embarrassing that he would act like this. It's like, you've met famous people before. Why are you acting like you've never met anybody famous before? He keeps making the guy go, hello, Harry. Oh, I love it. Do it again. Do it again. Over and over. It's like, shame. Um, and then he says that during this party, they decided to raid the fridge. And what should they find? But a huge box of black diamond mushroom chocolates. So they start gobbling those. And then he goes on a long story about all of his hallucinogenic experiences in which he thinks the toilet is speaking to him. Was it Megan? Anyway, then, <clears throat> um, I mean, it's just, it's so dull. On and on and on about then, and then I took these drugs and then I was high and this is my experience. And then we, I mean, it's just like, like real, no, like real nothing stories. It's like not even worth the tale to tell. And this is the thing too. Whenever people want to tell you about their hallucinogenic trips, it's like, okay, I'm about as interested in this as when you wake up and tell me about your dream. That means nothing to me. Anyway, and none of these, by the way, were like life altering. They were just like silly things, like the toilet talking to him. It's not like, you know, it's not like he had a long conversation with Gandalf. It's like just these random weird things that happened. I can't believe that made it in the book. But that ends part one. And now, finally, 30 minutes into this video, we get to Megan. Now you guys, the title of this part three is Captain of My Soul. And at least he realizes that. But why would you want it to be that way? Y'all, look at, look, look at this. Don't mind my scratches in the book. Like, Captain of My Soul? That's what we're doing with? That, that, that's, that's where we're going with now? <laughs> look, there they are in Africa, barefooted. Because they're just so, you know, normal. Okay. Let's talk about when he meets her. Let's talk about how, what happens. Okay. He's sitting at Notcot on his bed, scrolling Instagram as one does. And he sees a video of his friend, um, Violet. Violet is, with this, Violet is with this woman who is more beautiful than he has ever known a woman to be. Now, this video, they're like playing around with that dumb filter. Remember the dog filter, like with the little ears and the nose and the like the long tongue? I never understood why any grown person would spend even one second of their time playing with filters on their phone. Like I can understand like, uh, like maybe a mom and a child would like goof around with it or something like that. But like two grown adult women. And he goes on to talk about how he had never seen anybody with such a beautifully symmetrical face and he felt that the chaos of his life would be settled once he got that symmetry into his life. Take that Jordan Peterson. Um, and he says that what he knew instantly from the video was, listen to this. There was an energy about her, a wild joy, playfulness. There was something in the way she smiled, the way she interacted with Violet, the way she gazed into the camera, confident, free. She believed life was one grand adventure. I could see that. What a privilege it would be, I thought, to join her on that adventure. You got all that from a corny childish dog filter? The wild playfulness, a grand adventure. Anyway, he just knew he had to get that woman in his life. So he messages Violet and he's like, who's that woman? And she's like, yeah, you and everybody else in London wants to know. And he's like, no, really, who is she? And she's like, well, you know, she's just here for a little while. She's working for Ralph Lauren, but she's got to go back to Canada. But I can give her your information if you want it. 
He's like, please, anything. I'll sell my soul. And so Violet gives the information. Well, a couple days later, what should he get? Oh, a notification. Who could it be from? The American. And they message back and forth. She says that, you know, she really likes his Instagram feed. And, um, you know, they go back and forth a little bit. And she says that she has done a lot of work in Africa. And um, she's done some aid work there with children. And they talk back and forth about Africa. It's like already this, you know, this spider has been researching his Instagram feed. So she like knows immediately what she needs to say. Oh yeah, me too. I do a lot of aid in Africa with children and gorillas. So at the same time that he was meeting with her or that he was starting to message her. Um, and like, he says that it was like an all consuming thing. Like he couldn't put his phone down. He couldn't like, he couldn't do anything like he like was just glued to his phone and he was supposed to be going with sir keith because he had agreed to do this boating race and remember sir keith is the guy who's in charge of the invictus games so he says that he gets to sir keith's house right he's staying with this man okay and he says he went immediately up to his room so he could just keep texting do you hear this? This 31 year old man runs upstairs so he can keep texting his, you know, this girl that he just kind of, you know, that he just met rather than like speaking with his host, you know, being polite, runs up to his room, locks the door, stays in there until it's time to go to the race. <laughs> that is so wildly rude. I cannot even get past it. Okay. Anyway, Text, text, text. Finally, he's got to take a break. He's got to put the phone down. He's got to go race. It's a five hour race. How's he going to manage five hours without talking to her? Um, and he, this begins the most ridiculous story possibly in the book that I've read thus far. Okay. You hear what I'm saying? Cause we've read a lot of crazy things. We're going to get to, I, I consider this on par with, or maybe I would say almost worse than the stupid Tarja story. Okay, because if the Tarja story is real, that might have been pretty scary if you thought that you were frostbitten so bad that you might need to have surgery. I still don't even think that's a true story, but if it were true, it would make it like, I don't think the whole world needs to know about that, but maybe if you were, th like, it depends on how afraid you were about it. Anyway, this next story has absolutely zero worth to his book other than to just embarrassed like i feel so humiliated embarrassed for him that he shares this with us anyway um oh you should know before we get there <laughs> listen to this coincidence he says this is the day that they're getting together talking anyway it occurred to me how uncanny how surreal how bizarre that this marathon conversation should have begun on july 1st 2016 my mother's 55th birthday Let me assure you that that was not a coincidence. So um, anyway, we get on to the race. Um, before he even goes on the race, he writes that they decided that um, they should meet while she's still in London because she's going to be leaving soon. She she keeps saying that, like, I'm not going to be here that much. Like, I'm, I'm not really in London hardly at all. Like, uh, I just love you know I know you want to meet and all that but I'm really busy so like she's already making herself a commodity you know what I mean like 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 a rare commodity like you know, if you want to get with me and like really hard to pin down because I'm so busy I've got so much stuff to do like lucky you if you could manage to find some time with me but I just don't know how that's ever gonna really happen okay so she's already playing that song and dance anyway finally He's like, please, I really want to meet you. He's begging, begging, begging to meet her. So it's like, oh, where's your pride, Harry? And finally, she grants him. You know, she, she you know, put, puts out her scepter and allows him to walk into the room. She says, um, we can meet. And he says, well, where do you want to meet? And he suggests, you know, you could come to my house. And she says, your place on a first date? I don't think so. All right, so, you know. 
you know, she's just very clearly drawing boundaries, but it's not even in a nice way. Like, you know, it's like your place, question mark, on a first date, exclamation point. I don't think so, period. I feel like in that interaction, I would have been like, I think let's, let's try something like, let, let's meet somewhere else. Let's meet like in a public place. Like, I don't think that I would, I would try to phrase it in a way that he would feel stupid for saying that. Anyway, because why make somebody feel stupid? Um, I know that like the big thing now is ladies, you know, you need to, uh, you always need to be real harsh with a man because he needs to like not think that he can manipulate you into sexual situations. I don't think you need to be that way. You, know, you don't know if he was trying to ma manipulate you into a sexual situation. Don't assume the worst about a person. Just say, I'd rather not do that. Uh, let's meet in a public place. <sighs> Your place? On a first date? I don't think so. All right, so already I think she's kind of rude. But anyway, they agree to meet at this place called Soho House. And she says it's her headquarters whenever she comes to London and she'd reserve them a table in a quiet room. Okay, and then he says this. He hasn't told us her name, by the way, this whole time. Then he says, um, the table would be under her name, Meghan Markle. And truly, you guys, when I, when I read, I mean, I knew we were talking about Meghan the whole time, but when I read that name, my stomach dropped. It was like reading about a murderer and his victim. I just was like, the foreboding I felt at reading that name, I felt like I was reading a crime novel. Anyway, um, okay, back to the story that I had hinted at that was just wild to me. He goes on this boating exhibition with Sir Keith. Now, you guys, the, it was a five-hour race, okay? He says that it was a really fierce battle um, to navigate this boat the, the winds were crazy the waves were insane a lot of people actually had to drop out of the race not him okay you guys because he was just such an excellent captain um he says that the real problem had nothing to do with the waves though let him assure you the real problem was that there was nowhere to go to the bathroom and he says that it's all he could think about and he says that he held it as long as possible, but then he had no choice. He says he swung his body over the side into the tossing sea and he still couldn't pee, mainly thanks to stage fright. The whole crew was looking. Literally, why are you telling us this? And then he says, um, finally, he went back to his post and sheepishly hung from the ropes and then he peed his pants. This is the sentence. Finally, I went back to my post, sheepishly hung from the ropes and peed my pants. Wow, I thought if Miss Markle could see me now, Why in the world are you telling us this? Like, why did you tell us this? <laughs> a grown man can't hold it for five hours? What's wrong? Truly, what is wrong with you? Maybe you were damaged from the frostbite. It's five hours. If you went to the bathroom beforehand and you hadn't really had anything to drink, you can't hold it? you literally peeing your pants. Also, why are you hanging from the side of the boat to pee? Could you stand on the edge? You're a man, right? Like, why are you hanging from the side of the boat? I don't get that. <laughs> what in the world is that story? Then I hung over there by the ropes and she just like peed my pants. I can't, I can't, it's too crazy. Okay, anyway, they win, at least in their division. Um, yeah, okay, so good. Then he says that he, his only concern was jumping into the wa water to wash the pee off his trousers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then he starts talking about how, okay, now it's time for the date, okay? So he literally has just peed his pants, but he's gonna race back to London, you know, hopefully take a bath and um, then go meet Miss Markle. Okay, this is the part where I'm talking about like condescension just reigns supreme in this girl's personality. He says that when he was trying to get back, um, there was just, the traffic was horrendous. Every five minutes, like the traffic would stop and he'd just be sitting there and he was, he's like in a panic because he knows she's waiting for him and they're texting back and forth. And the texting is not going well, let me just say. Okay, so he says that he texted her, running a bit late, sorry. She was already there. And he apologizes again. It's horrible traffic. This is her reply. Okay, period. You guys, who among us would be okay with receiving that text? Um, why so cold? Why already being so controlling? Okay, period. 
Like he said he was sorry. Like what, 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 what? I mean, you know what the traffic in London is like. Like get on, get off his back. Why is she so rude already? Cause she knows she can be. That's the thing. She knows that she's so beautiful and he's already so hung up on her that she can treat him however she wants. And this is the problem. You know, Megan always is on and on and on about like, um, I wasn't like the pretty one. I was the smart one. And the truth is she's actually not the smart one. I mean, all we have to do is look what she named her podcast. Archetypes, really? It exposes your cavernous ignorance. But she truly has gone through life, not on her intelligence, but on her looks. And if she has any intelligence at all, it's that she knows how to manipulate people at the beginning, but she doesn't know when her hand is played. And that's her real problem. She doesn't know when to turn it off. Anyway, there he, there he is fighting the traffic. And she says to him, you just get out, walk. Okay. I don't, I, I, can't, I don't have forever. And, um, He's like, I'm sorry, the traffic's just still moving really slow. And she's like, well, then we're, you're gonna miss out on this because if you don't get here really fast, I mean, I've got other things to do today. And so he's like in a panic, like his heart is pounding. He can't get there fast enough. She's gonna leave. And she's, she's like letting him feel that way. She's letting him feel that way on the first date. Like, are you kidding me right now? And by the way, Harry, why are you letting this girl make you feel this way? Like if I, as a woman, was gonna go on a date with a man and he talked to me that way, I would be like, you know what? Uh, wait, uh, wait till the end of time, I'm not coming. Like, what is this? Okay, period, get out and walk then. I have other things to do today. Like, what the, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Ladies, would you take that from a man? I think not. Uh, Harry, why are you taking it from her? Don't let anybody treat you that way. Okay, <clears throat> so finally, He's, he writes this, he says, um, he just didn't answer that because he didn't know how to explain to her, like, I can't get out, the bodyguards would have to get out, uh, people would notice me, people would take pictures, like, I just, I just need to stay in the car. But he doesn't want to convey all that in text, so he doesn't say anything. And he goes, uh, texting wasn't the way to convey this, you know, getting out. So he's like, so I just, I didn't answer, which surely irritated her. Already at her mercy. Um... At last he arrives, red cheeks puffing, sweaty, half an hour late. He runs into the restaurant, into the quiet room and finds her sitting at the table. And of course she looks dazzling. <laughs> he says that he could, I couldn't imagine many people had been late for this woman. I settled into the sofa and apologized again. He'd already said sorry. Um, she said she forgave me. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Don't beat me too hard this time. She was having a beer, some sort of IPA, but she'd be drinking anything else. Um, they talk about this, that, and the other. Um, she was heart attack, she was heart attack beautiful, he says. Look, I'm not gonna take that away from her. She is gorgeous, like no kidding, she's beautiful. And she has a really um, unique beauty about her. And so I do not, I'm not surprised that he thought she was beautiful. We can all agree. Doesn't matter how much you hate Meghan Markle, she has a really pretty face but she doesn't have a pretty heart. Um, anyway, so they talk about this, that, and the other. She's like over there making him feel super small by talking about like um, how, like she she really hammers on about how smart she is. Like their first conversation, it's, it's all about me, 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 me. I did this, I did that. I'm a lifestyle writer, I'm a traveler. Um, I'm a corporate spokesman, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an activist, I'm a model. Um, she's been gone all over the world. She works for the U.S. Embassy in Argentina. This is what she says. Um, and, you know, so she clearly is the captain of her own soul. And she wants to let him know that she doesn't really need him. Like, she's not looking for it, you guys. Um, but, you know, her real plan for life, um, she wants him to know. My real plan for life is that I just want to help people do some good. Just be free. Okay. Well, you haven't helped anybody. You haven't done any good. And somebody is trapped under your tyranny. So, all right. I'm glad that that's what you want for your life. Um, 
Then he says that suddenly she just gathered up her things and was like, all right, I'm out. Bye. Good knowing you. <laughs> I got to go have dinner with my friends. And he's like, wait, wait, what? 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 Wait. I thought the conversation was going really well. And she's like, well, busy girl, busy gal. Gotta go. So she gets up, gathers the stuff, and shoots out of there. I mean, talk about rude. I'm not saying that she can't have had other things to do that day, but is that the exit you want to make? She's fine with it. So, like, she, she shoots off. She gets out of there right quick. And then he decides that he, you know, doesn't want to be alone, so he calls his friend. He asks if he can come on over. And when he gets there, his friend can tell just from his face that something has happened. And he's like, I'm not going to tell him. I'm not going to tell him. I'm not going to tell him. I told him. And he recounts the entire date, and then he's like, shit, mate, what am I gonna do? So out comes the tequila, because now, you know, he doesn't drink any of that English gin and tonic anymore. It's tequila all the way. Out comes the tequila, out comes the weed. We drank and smoked and watched Inside Out, an animated movie about emotions. Perfect, I was thoroughly inside out. Okay. Um, but during all of this smoking and drinking and cartoon watching, um, the phone rings. Oh, shit. I held up, I held it up for my mate. It's her. Who? Her. She wasn't just calling. She was FaceTiming. Okay, side note, you guys, what's up with people who just FaceTime? <laughs> I hate that. I hate that so much. No, I don't want to watch your face while you talk. Put the phone up, okay? That's what we're doing. That, that's what we're doing. No you, no, you don't just get to see my face. Get out of here. I hate that. I hate FaceTime so much. And people who FaceTime in public, it's like, we don't all want to be in on your conversation. And people who assume you want to FaceTime. Megan, of course, Megan would, because she knows her bread and butter is her face, you guys. So, of course, she's going to, like, thrust her face into yet every situation she can. She knows that if she calls him after that date they just had and she FaceTimes him, like, this is just yet one more ploy here. Because she knows that he finds her stunningly beautiful. So she can't just call him. She's got to FaceTime him. So um, just putting her claws in that much deeper. Hello? Hello? What are you up to? I'm with my mate. Um, what's that in the background? Oh, uh. Are you watching cartoons? No, oh, I mean, well, yeah, kind of. It's inside out. Okay, already this interaction. Can you imagine how embarrassed you'd feel? Like, she just, like, wants to make him feel like he's lame. And I mean, <laughs> between you and me, the wall, yeah, he is. But, like, if you're actually interested in, in, in a relationship with the per this person, why do you want to be with a, somebody who you think is lame? Like, why are you always trying to make him know that he's, like, not with it? That, that, that's, that's more of a criticism of you if you would pick somebody who you think is not your intellectual um, or emotional equal. Why would you want to be with somebody like that? Well, the answer is because they're very easy to ma manipulate and you get your way all the time. Anyway, he says that they, he walks out, you know, of the room because he kind of wants to just talk to her alone without, you know, the cartoons in the background. And, um... She said, he, he says to her, God, I love your freckles. And she, she said, she took, she takes a quick, it's so theatrical. She takes a quick breath. <gasps> Every time I'm photographed, actually, they want to airbrush them out because they don't think they're beautiful. It's like, oh my gosh, you're so manipulative. That's insane. Oh, no, no, they're, they're really beautiful. She said she's sorry she had to run. She didn't want me to think that she hadn't enjoyed meeting me. And I asked when I could see her again. Tuesday? <laughs> no, I leave Tuesday. Oh, tomorrow. <sighs> okay. Fourth of July. We said another date back at Soho House. Okay. So, let me see. Okay, this is our last story. Okay. <laughs> this video is like an hour long. Um, all right, so she'd spent the whole day at Wimbledon because she was cheering on her friend Serena Williams. Remember, she wants us to believe that she and Serena are super friends. And this time, he makes sure that he's at Soho House first, you know, because <laughs> can't have another repeat of that absolute beating. And she comes, and he had brought her a little present, 
she comes in beautiful. She's wearing a blue sundress with white pinstripes. She's a glow. And he stands up. I beg gifts. And it's a pink box. She held it forward and she shakes it. What's this? Oh, no, no, no. Don't shake it. Don't shake it. It's cupcakes. You know, red, white, and blue for the 4th of July. Already turning his back on the Brits. Um, she said they looked amazing. Um, they uh, sit there and talk and drink and kiss and order food that they don't eat. Then uh, nearing the end of the night, she turns to him and you guys, I can just hear her saying this and I can't with it. So after they've gotten done just canoodling and wasting food, um, she says that at the end of the night, as the night neared its end, we had a very frank discussion. There is no way around it. She puts her hand to cheek. What are we gonna do? That's what he, like, look at the prolonged O's here. What are we gonna do? Well, we have to give it a proper go. What does that even mean though? I live in Canada. I'm going back tomorrow. We'll meet. A long visit. This summer. <laughs> but my summer's already all planned out, Harry. I've already got an absolute jam-packed summer. I just don't have time to meet you again. And he says, well, mine, I'm busy too. And then she says, you guys, listen to this. Surely in the whole summer we could find one small spot of time. She shook her head. Mm-mm, sorry. She was doing the full eat, pray, love. Eat what now? Uh, the book. Oh, sorry. I'm not really big on books. Well, quite frankly, neither is she, if that's what she calls a book. Um, he says, I felt intimidated. Already on the second date. Would you want to go out with this person? Like, you guys, seriously, just look, pause on the story. So far, would you want to go out with Megan again? Like, from these two instances and, like, the texting and whatever, is this somebody that you would be like, I want to keep this feeling in my life? Like, I want to always feel small. I want to always feel judged. I want to always feel like I'm not quite good enough. Like, just because she's pretty, you, you are willing to throw away whatever scraps of self-confidence you had just because she's got a pretty face. Okay, anyway, back to the story. Um, he says he felt intimidated. She was so, she was so opposite of me. She read, she was cultured. <laughs> it's not important, she laughed. The point was, she was going with three girlfriends to Spain and then two girlfriends to Italy and then she looked at her calendar. I looked at mine. She raised her eyes. What is it? Tell me. Actually, there's one small window you don't say. Recently, she explained a castmate had advised her not to be so structured about the summer of eating, praying, and loving. We keep one week open, this castmate said. Leave some room for magic. So she'd been saying no to all kinds of things, reserving this one week, even turning down a very dreamy bike trip through the lavender fields of southern France. I looked at my calendar and I said, Well, I have one week open as well. <laughs> what if they're the same week? Well, what if? Is it possible? Well, how crazy would that be? Lo and behold, it's the same week. Get the heck out of here. I kind of tell you this much right now. That girl didn't have one dang thing planned for whatever week he was free on. Anyway, he suggests they spend it in Botswana. And he gave her his best Botswana pitch being like, it's the best place. If you're looking for magic, that's the best place to go. We could, you know, go look at some elephants. And they're going to camp under the stars in the middle of nowhere. And she stares at him. He goes, I realize it's crazy, but all of this is obviously a bit crazy. You're telling me. All right, that's where we end. Here we are an hour into this video, but you guys, what did we just read? How is it that he wanted to keep going out with this girl? I, I had the open mind. I did, you guys, I promised that I was going to read this with an open mind. I really was going to read it and be like, oh man, I can totally see why he went for her. Oh, she just really, 
she really 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 played him no he wanted to be played that is like so evidently obvious he didn't care what came out of her mouth he didn't care what she said she was just so beautiful to him that he needed that beauty in his life more than he needed a partner in life she was not going to partner with him it was very clear clear from the get-go you come with me i run this show you know let's put your leash and collar on get on all fours i mean it's just like so ridiculous to me crazyville that she was still that, that he would still want to go out with this girl after that first date of being stuck in traffic and her just like making him feel bad and then like offering him out of the out of the great overspill of her generosity the forgiveness that he was late she knew he was just he just been doing that boating thing you know she knew i mean like why in the world was she acting like like she was so put upon and i mean i'm not saying that you should be late to things okay i really don't like lateness either but what i am saying is if you think like she had they had talked for like hours up to this point obviously this is a person who you really would like to get to know can you not just ease up a little on the whole time thing like you guys can still text the whole time he's in the car right so so what's your problem like you can still and by the way okay this is my other thing too and i promise i really will go because you have other things to do why did it like they texted for ages like for days leading up to it like they were on the Instagram, DMing each other back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then they were exchanged numbers and they texted, texted, texted. But until he, she FaceTimed him after their first date, they had never picked up the phone and just had a proper conversation like a couple of adults. Everything about this relationship is so incredibly childish, starting with that dumb dog filter. Anyway, um, I can't wait to get into more of this because this girl is already driving me crazy. And I do not like her. And I tried, I tried, I tried, you guys. I, I give you my word I tried. She's just such a snake. Just such a snake, such a spider on the web, you know? Just waiting for the vibrations of Harry so that she can scuttle over. All right, that's the end of this video. I will see you again at some point later this week. I better not make any promises about when the videos are coming out. But there will be another one, another couple this week. So anyway, um, thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you again later. Bye-bye.